We will talk today about private capital, how private capital is getting involved or impacting the education sectors in everywhere, but in particular in, 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 emerging, in emerging economies. And as you know, private capital is not new in the sector. In many countries, the, be, the first schools were uh, private. In almost all countries, private sector provides from material to books, to food, to furniture, to schools, to extracurricular activities. However, in the last 15, 20 years, we have been seeing a, a hype of private sector getting involved. Billions of dollars in, in private equity funds, uh, entrepreneurs all over, accelerators, incubators, social impact investors. So we will discuss why is this happening now in, in, the, in education. We will discuss if this is having real impact on quality. It, it looks like it's having some impact on access. There's more access provided at every level from the private sector to students in every country. Is it really having any impact on, on quality? Are students learning more from the private sector? Why is this still an ideologically you know, debate in so many countries? You have so much backlash from the US to Latin America, to Africa, when a private investor gets involved or with an entrepreneur, a for-profit education gets involved in, in education. So to discuss some of these issues and, and many other ideas that hopefully you bring to the, to the debate, we have a fantastic group of uh, panelists from different uh, stakeholders, from different groups of this, of this uh, debate. We have Ashwin from probably the premier uh, consultancy in this sector, Partenon, who will share with us some conclusions of his report. We have Charles bringing te trying to bring te technology to the sector, investing also from the private capital, from the ca private sector. We have Tutsi, who started her own company. More than 800,000 students are having ac access to, to higher education, thanks to the credits that she provides to them. And we have Inet from Omidyar. Piero Omidyar is the founder of eBay that sold the company and started a social impact investment fund, uh, working on many issues, in particular in education. And we will ask him also, what is this social impact thing? Why is this so important now in this, in this sector? No? So it will be a very open uh, discussion. I will ask perhaps the first uh, 15 questions, no, the first one or two questions to the panelists, and then please guys get involved and, and participate, and I'm sure all of you know our decisions and can make some comments as well. So I'm gonna start with you, Ashwin. Can you tell us briefly why is this, all this hype now about private sector getting involved in education? And share with the public, I'm sure many already read, but two or three conclusions, or main conclusions of the report that you just produced and presented here at, at WISE. Yeah, sure. So th thanks, Gabriel. Um, the reason we actually wrote this report was to share some of the perspectives that we have gained uh, over the last 20 years of working with both uh, the private sector and the public sector across the world. Uh, and we focus wholly and solely on education. Uh, and the few lessons that we, you know, we wanted to bring to, to the forefront is that you know, when you go out, especially in developed markets, and talk about the, uh, the idea of private capital and pr the private sector in education, sometimes it's, it's greeted with, with a sense of apprehension and, and sometimes even disgust. How can private capital, how can the private sector operate in a sector that should be focused on social good? Right? So it's a public good. That's, that's what it's always been. But I think a few lessons. One is that the private sector can produce better quality and good quality uh, in terms of its educational outcomes. So we see across emerging markets in, in Africa, in Asia, students coming out of private higher education institutions with great chances of employability because they're focused on employability-related courses, their universities are focused on getting them into the right jobs and ensuring that their degrees are aligned and the cost of those degrees are aligned with the salaries that they will get paid. So the first thing is around quality. The second thing is around access. And what we see, again, in many economies is that the public sector just doesn't have the, the resources to build out the number of seats required in all parts of, of the education value chain, right through from early years through to schools and, and higher education. And what you can see in markets like Dubai, uh, and we've, we've shown case studies like GEMS, is that there, are, there is an ability of private sector firms to be very nimble and flexible in their approach to providing education solutions. So for example, GEMS, which is a, is a case study in the, in the report, can provide Indian curriculum education at $2,000 per year 
to a population of Indian expats, but also IB education at $25,000 per year to the premium uh, Western expat as well. So I think you know, the access, the quality argument, and the need for the public sector to work closely with the private sector is also very important. So there's a, an area in the report that we, where we talk about how the government can set itself up to create the right ecosystem to support the development of the private sector and also control it. So how do you ensure that there are no cowboys operating in the, uh, the, the private sector? Thank you so much. Binet, you have been investing in several companies or funds uh, focused on education across emerging economies. What is the relationship of those companies and the government? Is the government a barrier? Is the government a good regulator, a bad regulator? Give us some concrete experiences of, of or, or, or they are neutral or they don't. That's a, a, a great question. Um, I probably can't reveal too many sort of secrets because it's information relating to private companies. Um, but it's very, very important going to Ashwin's uh, point. I mean, education is a regulated sector. And, you know, when young children are involved, you can argue it needs to be. As with anything, it can be done well or it can be done not so well. Depends on what the regulatory framework is driving towards. So uh, I think for any company in education, but in any kind of business, it makes sense to have good relationships with your regulators. Um, w whether the regulators are supportive of the, the companies or uh, not so supportive, depends a lot on very country-specific dynamics. It also depends a lot on whether the efforts are framed as this is a collective approach to trying to solve a problem, or whether it's framed as uh, pointing fingers and saying, you know, you're rubbish, we're not, or the other side saying, you're rubbish, we're not. It looks like in the education sector, there's much more opposition to private investment than any other ones. You look to energy or you know, consumer goods or any other ones, even though they are regulated, you don't see so much. Why, why, why is this happening? It's like an ideologically statement or is that a real concern for quality? Because quality of schools are very, is very low almost everywhere anyway, no? So why are we so concerned the private sector will not provide good quality? If quality is low anyway. I think um, it's a very fair question. I think one of it is education is a service. So unlike um, energy or cars, etc., which are, you know, those are more uniform products. Um, education is hearts and minds, what people think they themselves are capable of. So because it's a service and because I think equity comes in very, very quickly, it is a much, much more emotive topic. Um, I mean, Totsi will have seen in, in South Africa the depth of the passions that can be uh, uh, roused. Um, and I think that's also where the equity lens starts to uh, become very, very important because while education, I mean, from a pure economist perspective, education is, you know, has very strong positive spillovers, but it's arguably also a rivalrous good. If one person is better educated, they probably have more of a chance to do better. So this is where the equity thing becomes really, really important. And I think if you step back and put yourself in the sh uh, shoes of, let's say, system-level stakeholders, what, what they will often be challenged with is to say, okay, what is happening in the system? Is it that the, those who are already better off are pulling further away? Or is it that the whole system is rising? And I think that's where the, the, one of the big uh, challenges, and I think the, we think the private sector can absolutely play a, uh, a strong part in system-level support. Um, but we have to be mindful of that that's the big framework. Uh, and, and, you, and this is not just for the global south. This happens in Sweden. It happens in the U.S. where people are getting very worried about some of the unintended consequences. Thank you. Tutsi, you started up a company. You are a successful entrepreneur. You are providing loans to families, for, to their children to finish college or go to post-secondary education. How was your relationship with the government? Are you feeling an empty space that the government was not uh, filling? Or are you working with the government? Are you fighting with the government? Actually, we, we work uh, in cooperation with government, even though we're not a government institution. We're in a privileged situation to be able to, to provide finance for what one may call the missing middle, because you find that uh, 
the bulk of our clients are those clients that are not poor enough to access government funding, but also are not rich enough for them to access uh, funding from banks. So we do focus on the middle, uh, on, on, on the missing middle. The bulk of our clients, actually 90% of our clients are actually public sector clients, because in many instances, with regards to the South African context, they don't access what we, we call uh, RDP housing, neither do they access education finance because they end above the threshold that government focuses on. In many instances, for those that are not working for government, we also have a credit regulator who focuses, uh, who, who is the national credit regulator, which therefore suggests that we cannot give finance to people that cannot pay back. That's why the people that we finance are those that are already employed, but are improving their own skills so that they can create uh, better opportunities for their families. But over and above that, 30% of them are people that are actually financing their own kids. And Charles, going to Europe, you know, we, we talk a lot here, and many of us are from emerging economies, we see so much you know, the dynamism in this, in this sector. But is it possible to bring that dynamism or innovation to, to the Euro European education sector? Perhaps we are biased, but we see a more... Government is very involved, it's a much bureaucratic system. The, 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 the education quality is not that, that high anyway in, in so many countries. Is it possible to make a difference from the private sector? Are there entrepreneurs getting involved in the education sector in Europe? I think the starting point, yes, there is. The entrepreneurial activity is, is there. The question is, how is that harnessed into uh, education? And, and taking a step back, I think, you know, understanding the problem is key to it, which is that, you know, w within the next 20 years, there are probably going to be about another 900 million students seeking enrollment into uh, the education establishments around the world. And yet, you know, the economies and government expenditures are limited and they're already at high levels of, of their overall expenditure on education. So we're going to have to find ways to solve that problem of bringing them into the education. Does Europe have an issue? I think it does have an issue because there isn't that same what, you know, we'd like to refer as that kind of learn to earn, that hunger for, for learning which will make a difference to outcomes. There's much more of a, an expectation of state provision in kind of uh, Europe as it relates to, to education. And what I think will emerge is that as, you know, technology and innovation starts to have an impact, particularly in, in emerging economies, that that rise of education will have a, an effect on the economic um, uh, kind of order within those different economies, which will have a feedback loop into, into Europe and start to drive that innovation further. Thank you, Charles. Any question from the public? Any comment? Michael, I'm glad you're breaking the ice. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Michael Staten from Learn Capital. Um, uh, I think the, the conversation around private capital and education right now is a bit blunt. It's a bit about the, the whole idea of providing a school, providing seats in the school, having kids go to the school, graduate from the school. Um, but a lot of the financing activities, many of which are covered by uh, both Ashwin and Charles, and uh, we have investments in common with Omidyar, are about looking at the complex puzzle of things that need to come together and financing innovative solutions for little pieces of that puzzle, right? So attendance records, reminding students of assignments, uh, instructional games that help people go through curriculum quickly. Uh, and they're actually little bitty pieces of the puzzle. Um, and I'm wondering uh, if you guys have comments on, I guess, like, uh, finance and innovation, not as the, the whole banana, but actually kind of these like complex little pieces that then can be reassembled on the other side. Any comment? Um, Thank you, Michael. No, I think it's a, a, a very good question. And I think particularly as you look at, at innovation and kind of financing these bits that you talk about, I think what we see as an observation is the fact that, that it is chaos out there. There are lots of different pieces. And nobody really knows which are the right pieces. And the, the schools, the teachers, government, uh, and administrators who are involved in the decision process as it relates to the institutional supply of education really struggle to work out which ones to, to choose from. And when it comes to then the financing of those kind of businesses, 
then you know the, there is at this stage a, an element of you know early stage investing in businesses which the outcome is is also heavily impacted by the fact that nobody really knows where the course and direction of travel is for some of these institutions and that from my view turns to a point which is where government does have a big role to play in terms of starting to set the agenda as to what the direction of travel and helping teachers and institutions make decisions about which are the right kind of solutions for their environments. Because without that type of guidance and help, then I think it will continue being a chaotic environment for a little time to come, and there will be a lot of tears and wasted but, capital along that journey. But they want to, go to, sorry, want to push back a little bit in that, in that question. You don't see in any other sector entrepreneurs or investors asking for the government to regulate them or organize them. You, go, you see energy, you see any other sector, entrepreneurs are doing them, you know, working, trying to scale up their company. You don't see Elon Musk asking, please, I need the government to, you know, organize my sector. It looks like in this sector you see a lot of us in the private sector trying to not just work with the government, of course, you have a good relationship, they are a big buyer, but why are we so demanding for government regulation or demanding for more government organization? Trying to be provocative. Yeah. No, it's a, good, a very good point. I think, you know, my, my immediate answer is that you know, education has a high degree of trust attached to it. And trust then links to the certification of that. And so you need a framework which gives the kind of the consumption of that good trust. And that's where that framework comes in. So you need to have that. How it then impacts in terms of the decision making of which choices, then I agree, then, you know, that's a big debate as to what level of involvement there should be. But you do need that framework. Okay, thank you. You have a comment and then Binet Totsi. Uh, I, I agree that a uh, framework is required, but it doesn't mean that uh, there aren't opportunities to engage, be it the schools or the universities directly in terms of what their needs are. We, we operate in two different uh, areas where we, one of our strategic partners actually provides support for schools whereby the teachers don't have to focus on doing too much administration because then they are given one a, a technology for them to communicate with the parents, whereby you know that your child is, is, is playing sports at a particular day, but also if there's an assignment, you don't have to be signing different pieces of paper. And that is technology that is required. The challenge is that those schools that are poor schools then cannot access that technology because that technology in terms of way, where we are now, it's technology that the school has to pay for. But in a different environment with regards to, to higher education, we actually have exciting technology whereby we, provide, we enable the students to be able to use the money that they get, be it as a bursary or as a loan, for what it's intended for. So we use pocket technology whereby... If you have to use the money for books, you can't then use it for food. But what, what's interesting with, with, with that pocket technology that we have is that it's not the university, neither is it the parent that pays for it, but it's the people that actually provide the service that are close to the university because obviously they want feet onto their doors and therefore they are willing to pay for it. If education is a service and it's a trust-based service, it's also a very complex service. So the uh, view we take is the idea of finding any one magic solution, just, it's not like a vaccine, it, just, it doesn't work like that. So either it's specific parts of the value chain, um, so it could be an ed tech, uh, 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 it could be on the data system. Another thing we're seeing, and, and we're excited about it, is the demand for knowledge is there. And it's after school. I mean, we, I mean, this is one of the if if um, k traditional school is the equivalent of a pay monthly contract. The poorer families want their kids to be better educated. If you look at the lower quintile in terms of purchasing power, they're actually very underserved for after school. So people are now starting to use technology to develop after school tuition businesses which are saying, well, it's, it's, it's filling a vacuum, it's filling a demand. It's just another example of, I think it's, it's credit to you for the phrase distributed learning. Well, one second here, but I wanna, just to follow, to follow up this discussion, Ashwin, in your cases you research about, did you see any government trying to, not helping or not these companies, but trying to engage more private capital in the sector? I mean, we uh, see that, or yeah, we see that all over um, the, the, the GCC. We see this in Singapore. We see this in Malaysia, where you see 
you know, the, what they're trying to do. And there's a report in that little blue brochure over there called the Role of Regulators, where we actually highlight some of the case studies of how the job of the regulator is not only to ensure quality and uh, make sure that pricing is under control to, to some extent, but it is also to encourage investment and the right kind of investment. And just to pick up on Michael's point, which is, you know, Everyone's talking about direct delivery, which I think is his point. Everyone's talking about investing in schools or universities or early years. Well, that's where a lot of the capital goes because the big PE is looking at that. In the early stage investors, you have got these allied services, you know, some sort of learning management systems, these apps, these different services that you can provide to educational institutions. But that's not, you know, that's not where the big capital is looking at right now. We have seen in Brazil, and you'll be familiar with this, um, a very big allied sector to education, which is a services sector called uh, learning systems. Uh, these are, are school in the box. So when you have a, an economy where the private system is quite underdeveloped, which it is in, in Brazil for schools, they need the guidance on how to run and open a school. And literally this is what companies like Positivo and Abril are selling to, um, you know, to these private school companies. And these have built big scale businesses and attracted a lot of private capital. Pearson actually acquired one of those companies for, I think, like $900 million yep, SEV yep, a few years ago. No? You had a comment. Uh, my name is Shahida Salim, and I am a fund manager. Um, we're doing innovative impact investments in education in Pakistan. Uh, we've had several discussions in the country revolving around this theme, and just some comments that I'd like to share and get your thoughts on. One is um, what Michael had said earlier in terms of dis um, value chain pieces. But in our discussions, what um, the focus was really on new delivery mechanisms, new models for delivery of education and uh, financing those models. That was one. Social impact bonds came up. What's the role of the private sector in a social impact bond? And can we alleviate some of the risk mechanisms associated with government trying out innovation and um, is that there innovation. any specific example of where social impact bonds are working? Yes, That's in a much Utah, conversation. Where? in the U.S., um, Goldman Sachs had its social impact mm -hmm. bonds in education. In Utah, it has actually given a return on investment um, for the first time. It's the first social bond that has actually been successful and uh, earned a revenue. So I think some of those models in terms of what are we actually financing? Are we looking to finance kind of entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs, or are we looking to address that system as a whole and financing education and, and the cost of education delivery to a particular child and perhaps bringing that cost down? A range of debates here, which is, first of all, the overall cost of education and how is that funded, which is, um, uh, I think, a debate in itself. You have an, another debate is, how do you bring innovation into the market and how is that funded? And what typically occurs there is that the innovation tends to be more likely to be funded from the private sector because it's more flexible, it's quicker to look at opportunities and identify those opportunities and then try and seek to fund them. The, the challenge, I would say, at that end is what we observe is, is really how little capital is really being invested into the education technology space. And if you consider, for example, that if you take the content industry as a whole, education spend is about three times the whole of the content industry, and yet the amount that's invested into kind of education technology is a very small sum. I mean, we, we estimate that in 2014, it was just about 1.6 billion that was invested into ed tech businesses around the globe. And that compared to other industries is, is tiny compared to what this innovation is expected to deliver to that sector. And why there's not enough investment? No. It's such a fantastic opportunity. Why people are not putting money there? Well, I think Ashwin kind of touched on it slightly earlier, which is we're, we're talking about kind of uh, private capital. There's, there's a wealth of kind of funds in the world that looking to invest in opportunities, but what they're looking for is big deals where they can invest kind of more than $10 million, more than $20 million. Um, and, you know, the ideal package is, you know, they want to find an asset there, you know, hundreds of millions. And if you're looking at innovation in education, there just aren't those type of businesses. But why there's no capital is that, you know, the truth is that we're scared of investing in early stage businesses. We depend on individuals and kind of family offices and foundations to do that. And yet there is a huge opportunity there and we need to find a solution.
Well, sorry, Vinet and then Tutsi, yeah. On the question of why isn't there enough, because we think that's where the private uh, uh, capital has the ability to take risk, which government systems often don't have, right? They're already spending so much money, and if government gets something wrong, it gets criticized. So that, there is a symbiotic role where, where people with private risk capital say, well, okay, we'll take this risk. Um, but you're right, there isn't that much happening. One of the things we've noticed is that unlike, say, consumer businesses, where if you're successful, you can grow, because it is a regulated sector, because your, uh, your biggest customers are governments or you know, smaller units of government, the sales cycle for an effective startup is a lot tougher. Because it's just, your, so if you're already an incumbent business, you have long, steady relationships, the barriers to entry are actually quite high. So if you're a scrappy little startup saying, I've got this great idea, you need to sell it, but you're not selling it to the direct consumer, you're in a market where you're more dependent on wholesalers, whether those wholesalers are existing large companies or directly the government. The government. And that makes it a little tougher. And I mean, I think we can all think about how do you level that playing field, because that is um, stacked against the startup right now. Very good comment. Thank you. Tutsi. I, I, I think the issue of uh, the value chain becomes an inter interesting opportunity again because one still needs to make sure that you focus on the area that you understand. The one approach that we've used uh, before is on a different product and not necessarily on technology whereby we understood that for us to impact education, we can't only do salary deduction as loans. And we needed to make sure that we can begin to take a little more risk in other areas. And what we then did was we asked for an investment, which is what we call school fees, to say, can we get funding from the shareholders whereby we can pilot to make sure that it works? The condition was, after you've used 20 million rands, make sure that you can then go to the market and get more money. It becomes easier for the market to be willing to fund something that even if, if, if it's in a small scale, is tried and tested, and we found that it became much easier. Right. Very good point. Have a comment there. I'm from Pakistan, a country of 200 million people. Next couple of decades, we're gonna add another 100 million um, to market. our population. Um, education uh, has been a big topic for Pakistan. Uh, the government is there, regulations are very much there. Um, they do enable, but they do not implement. Um, and as you know, nature abhors a vacuum. And uh, we set up, uh, or my grandmother set up schools in 1948, just at the time of partition. Um, and those schools uh, are a trust, not-for-profit trust, and they've grown over 66 years. And we've reached a population of about 12,000 children. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, a fund from New York came knocking on our door to say that we have a good name brand and we'd like to invest with you. But we need a different model as the investors need some money back. And so it's taken us about a year and a half, but we put something together and the Acumen Fund has invested with us to roll out new schools. And what we've noticed is what we've done in the last 66 years and what we've done in the last two years and the amount of growth that we've been able to do with um, a fund coming in with us and us knowing what we are doing. Um, our issue in Pakistan is that not many but people know how to access funds. But why was that positive? Why Acumen helped you to grow faster? What I think were you what, what happened doing? was uh, because of the trust, uh, it grew on its own um, momentum. Uh, there were no financial institutions willing to invest in education at that point. Uh, donors typically come in to invest in infrastructure, bricks and mortars, whether it's USAID or DFID or whoever. And that's not what we're looking for. Uh, we are looking to actually go into communities and we take on homes and we convert them into schools and start pre-primary schools over there. So what we've done the last uh, year or two when we've opened schools, we've had such a huge uh, demand and we, again, we have to reject children. Um, and we are running out of, of space to keep children. What we're looking for is instead of somebody coming to look for us again and wake us up, how do we uh, kind of wake up and, and where do we go and, 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 and look for people who can help um, put the educators um, and entrepreneur investors to make social impact. Uh, yeah. That's what we're looking for. I, I think uh, I was just nodding uh, uh, my head because we, we're seeing what you defined as that capital supply gap a lot. 
I mean, if, if you, in, in your case, you're running an actual school system, the cash flow value of your business is higher than the, the residential property value. And, and most traditional lenders won't be able to get their heads around it. And that's right. why you have a capital supply gap. Um, it would be great if that can be, start to be addressed. It has been in other sectors. It's just a slow process. Again, it comes back to some enlightened um, risk taker whether it's a donor, whether it's government, facilitating that. And, and in all, even in the most developed countries, you will find that the initial r slug of risk was taken by someone who had a, their eye on a bigger picture. I think your case study, again, highlights the point where private capital, it's not only about the money, but it's also some of, something to do with the capabilities, the skill sets, the, the business style of thinking that can help grow. Uh, help you grow and expand access and it does do good and that's what we've seen with a lot of private equity companies they'll com come and take over a small group of schools and then they'll use that base to go and expand into new geographies um, new types of curriculum and, and more innovative schools uh, and, and that as, as i say drives up access i really think we're going to have to think very much more innovative so let's take my country. South Africa has 20,000 schools that are falling apart in how broken they are. We cannot wait. Government doesn't have the money. We can't wait for all this stuff to happen because it's going to take forever. We need to do something immediately. Now, what does private sector have that they can offer immediately? They have knowledge about f management, leadership, HR, fight, IT, finance, the stuff that the, te the principals and the teachers have no idea about. So we can tap into that overnight is to mobilize and make it make it you know a kind of sexy thing for business leaders with knowledge about in those areas to bring that into schools and when they are in the schools then is the time for them to say well actually how do we how do we scale up IT because or edtech because the the reality is that the education the people who are currently in the education system are just overwhelmed and they can't breathe. Your actually. recommendation is to outsource all the schools to the private sector? No, 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 no. no. no to bring What's them in as a contribution, to, to rethink corporate social citizenship. How, how does it happen? How, it happens how, physically. A dialogue? In, no, no, no. Well, we, we've currently got 366 senior business leaders, many of them CEOs, working with principals. And they have paid for the privilege to work with a principal as part of their leadership development because they've said, I can learn more about complexity and ambiguity and leading in a VUCA world when I go into a township and work with a principal where there's no knowledge and understanding about how to do I can learn. So I'm doing this because I want to learn. I'm doing it because I'm caring about the future of my country. Our country is at risk because our growth rate is dependent on our ability to mobilize to fix education. So I just I think there's a different conversation around the role of, of private sector, which is not just money. Money is a very, t you know, it's a tiny contribution that private sector can bring. Because what we're seeing is the more these business leaders come into schools, they, 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 they bridge that gap and they, and they say, they help the children think about what the future jobs are. They invite the teachers into, we find that in, in South Africa, 70% of the teachers have never been to a workplace other than a school. Thank you. That's a good idea. What, what do you guys think? Any comments, Lydia? We are actually part of that program, which, which I think for me, not only does it help the, the principals or also the schools in terms of enabling that you bring skills that the principals may not necessarily have, but also enable the principal to work with the team, which may be the teachers in terms of team building. And we found that it's not a big contribution, but it's a needed contribution. And the more we can duplicate that model and make sure that we apply it in other areas other than on the leadership space. And we are right to say in the technology space, we also need to look at what is it that we're talking about when we talk about CSI. For example, we do other things in CSI, but I think the issue of bringing technology to the schools, because we have the technology as, as private sector institutions, that's another area that has not been explored, but I think it, it should be looked at. Thank you, Tutsi. There's a comment over there. Uh, hi. So I actually uh, work with Acumen Fund and, uh, you know, we've been investing in uh, social entrepreneurs and ideas. My question is more around scale. And just to sort of give you uh, some numbers, uh, in India, for example, we have 1.3 million schools, 300,000 of them are private schools. But the largest single school chain operator has just 300 schools. Similarly, a private, uh, you know, ed tech company, Curriculum Provider, which is a listed company in India, managed to reach only about 20,000 of those 300,000 schools. 
Now, uh, that, that is also the reason why we're not seeing growth capital come into this sector, because we're not seeing scale in the private enterprise. We're seeing a lot of innovation, early stage companies that are doing a lot of that work. So my question is essentially twofold. Is the role of private sector going to be more focused on innovation and then coming up with these new ideas and then sort of handing it off to the sort of public sector? Or if there's a way for private enterprises to scale, do they need to sort of find a common agenda and working together and pull their resources together, maybe then achieve some sort of scale? That, that's a fantastic topic. And I would like to add to that is, and you, you elaborated a little bit, uh, Vinette, on that, is why all these entrepreneurs are not scaling. You know, you're, in your research, it's six, seven companies. But in addition to that, why are the reasons one could be the market is so hard to you know, sell to governments, but why we don't see much, we see so many billions of dollars investing, but we don't see entrepreneurs scaling up there, only a few scale up, no? So in addition to that, sorry. I think to address the point, I think the, uh, the answer to the question is there's a room, f there's a role for both. Um, and we see, yeah, I mean, we work a lot in the school area and you're right. Whichever market you look at, no school company, uh, except for one market that we've looked at, has more than sort of 20% market share. Um, Which is the market? Which market? It's Dubai. Dubai. Yeah. Um, now, the, the, the role that private capital can play is, as, a, as we've seen, they can go in, buy one school or buy one university and use the knowledge of that university or that school to roll out uh, into more campuses, into more schools, into new geographies. And we see that a lot. And what has to happen is the private equity investor or the foundation needs to take a longer term view of the returns they need to get. And we've seen that. And we've seen some of the largest funds in education, companies like Brigal, KKR who have invested in schools, the Cognita schools, uh, Bering that have invested in North Anglia. And they've held these assets for over seven years. And they still continue to hold them. Um, whereas typically with other industries, they're looking to get out in three to five years. So there's a role for them to do that. And also there's a role for um, investors to get in uh, with some of the smaller, you know, more innovative products. And one, one example of that is there's a small group of investors that got together after selling their company in another sector and built an uh, a business called Coders Trust, which teaches kids how to code in Bangladesh. And they work with microfinance institutions to, to, raise, uh, to raise money. And there's a, a student lending model out there, so they lend money to, to these students. Uh, they learn how to code, and they get the kids' jobs, which is what makes it sustainable, which allows the kids to pay it back. So there's lots of great models out there across all the different investment sizes, and I agree, and the uh, in the smaller end of the ticket size, you, ha you see a little bit more innovation because there's more, more appetite for risk and uh, innovative concepts. Any other comment, Charles, Vinet? I think the work that we've done is, is, I think we assess that it probably takes about five times longer to scale in the education market compared to more direct-to-consumer propositions. Why is that? And that is because the number of gatekeepers that are involved in the process are that many more. So you've, you know, you go from the student to the school teacher to the school to the district to uh, local government to government, and you've got all these different players who've got a view on, on kind of the role of, of change within that ecosystem. And it, it answers a lot of the questions that here, which is that means that innovation is going to be slow. It means it's longer for entrepreneurs to scale in the industry. It means finance is less attracted unless it's more patient. The structure of funds in the private capital market tend to be much shorter term than is justified for this particular market. So a lot of the factors have to, 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 to change to get the, the appreciation. But what we do know is that from a long-term perspective, you know, education is a great place to be. You know, there's, there's a huge hunger for it. So, you know, people shouldn't be shy about coming into the sector. It's just they need to adjust their expectations. Thank you. Vinet, and then we go to you. It's who's making the purchasing decision. If it's more and more concentrated, it's slower, longer, it's more exposed to, let's call them idiosyncratic risks. Some encouraging trends are where you're starting to see decentralization, where the purchasing decision is being pushed down whether it's into the county, whether it's into a province, whether in the case of London, it's actually into school districts. Um, the flip side is, then you can also have too many under-informed uh, uh, purchasers. You know, the, uh, if you're a principal, how, how do you decide which product? So what's really intriguing is, uh, I'm not a US expert, but in the US, the Department of Education is saying federal money is being used to buy technology. Um, that's fine, the, the purchase decision sits with the school district. How do we set up a framework so that the districts know what is 
works and what doesn't. So this goes back to, you know, if it's done right, it'll hopefully be enlightened because it'll save them making, buying a bad product, but it'll still leave the decision with them because they're also the ones most accountable for the performance of the kids in their district. So I think that's where it comes to. Thank you. There's a comment there. And then a comment there. Chris Crane with Edify. We make uh, loans to uh, low-fee independent schools in Africa and Latin America. There are only um, a handful of organizations, as uh, Claire Trainor, uh, who's just over there, pointed out yesterday in her presentation, in, in our space, uh, Typically, low-fee independent schools in any country are educating 20 to 70 percent of the students in that country. So there's a need for hundreds of more organizations to come into the field. So a question for Vineet, uh, do you see many more organizations coming into the field to try to fund the many hundreds of thousands of low-fee independent schools? And what types of organizations do you see coming in to do that, Vineet? We see a lot of interest, and uh, what we're seeing is people are trying to engineer it in lots of different ways. So. Um, I mean, the, the low-fee independent sector remains a uh, very fragmented sector. So you're looking at essentially small businesses. Um, we've already talked about, you know, there are some chains that are growing and are successfully growing, um, but there are few and far between. So the type of capital uh, uh, is, is different. So, so there are some organizations that are trying to work with microfinance, try and say, okay, if we can work with the lender to make it, uh, create a business lending product. There are others who are sort of t flipping it around and saying, well, actually, if we can uh, fund the student uh, rather than the business. So I, th I think we're seeing a lot of ideas. Which ones will work will probably be very context specific. We found a, a very interesting situation in South Africa where the public investment corporation who actually holds the pensions of public servants ha have taken a bold step to actually invest in lower end private schools. But it's created yet another political dynamic whereby the teachers in public schools are saying, why are you buying private schools? And the whole issue of educating our communities to say, much as we need public schools, we also need private schools. It doesn't mean that uh, competition is bad. It depends on what it is that parents can afford and what it is that parents are looking for. But that's an area that we need to look at also, not only in, in affluent areas, but also in poor areas to make sure that we begin to invest in lower end private schools so that we can ensure that we can increase the ability of the kids to be uplifted from those communities too. Thank you. There's a comment over there. Good morning, everyone. My name is Frederick Odiembo from Kenya. I'm a former street boy, but not now. And we, I'm d we are deal with the uh, girl and boys in Kenya, street children. And we have 150 children in a school center in, a, in Kenya. Can I welcome you there to see what is going on in slums in a, a Kenya? So I want people who come, can come to uh, help me with my team there. We have four ch teachers and this is not enough. We want a lot of training more. Hi, my name is Nadia um, and my company develops women within the engineering industry. So it's not a school, but rather enrichment programs and employability programs. So my question is actually around gap funding, because what we find and we private sector funded is that there's a lot of interest in startups. Um, and when your organization is like reaching a million students, but there's this gap where you kind of 10 years old, you're not yet at that sexy, sweet investment spot. Um, and there's kind of no f real, ga there's, there's a gap in, or kind of a vacuum in funding. So until you get to a million, you know, nobody's really interested. But when you're at 10,000, you know, there's no real keen investor to help you get to kind of next stage. I think that's a fantastic comment. And I see that everywhere. I, I'm from Latin America. You see the same. A lot of seed money, half a million dollars. Michael was saying that, one million dollars yesterday. But then if you own $3 million from $10 million, it's almost impossible. Then if you need $25 million, there's every, everyone. How, how do you see, is, is, is there anyone uh, trying to get in that uh, market? And Ashwin, is there a role for the government there? In Latin America, there are some funds backed by the government getting involved in that stage, no? 
Wait, can you make some, some comment, Vinit? It's not just in education, actually. Um, some of my colleagues uh, uh, came out with a, a recent report um, that uh, really just highlighted that there is, the, there is a, 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 a supply gap, a capital supply gap. Um, and, and it varies. So in some places, there's not enough seed or risk. In some places, you can find the seed and risk capital takers, but then you, you have that gap in the middle until you become a listed business. Um, it does need to, 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 to be addressed. Um, and I think no one organization, no one concept is going to do it. Yeah. I mean, there, there is an organization that we work with, which is the IFC. And they're the commercial arm of the World Bank. And their aim is to deliver a financial return, but with a social impact. And they will write ticket sizes um, in the region of three to... 25 million, I mean, I don't know the exact sizes, but they are very, they're not like the big private equity, they're, there's no minimum ticket size, uh, and they're not looking to make sort of seed investments, they're looking to see a business that's a little bit more developed than, uh, than, than a startup. But why the private sector is not getting involved? I mean, the IFC is a multilateral organization, but, but why, why do, you, do you guys see that the private, it's not the, there's not a business opportunity there? They are, and there are foundations, other foundations like the McBain Foundation that, that is there, but they're looking at specific geographies and maybe specific niches within education. Um, so I think if you comb around the world and you go to these kinds of conferences, you will meet people who are interested in investing capital at, at that ticket size. Okay. Michael, you have a comment on that, and then Charles. Yeah, um, well, one kind of element that's missing from the conversation here is, um, is actually the role of limited partners. Um, and most people in this community don't really even know what a limited partner is, but basically Learn Capital, EdTech Europe, I think your fund, Acumen Fund, uh, it's not necessarily our money. We have to go find that capital that's interested in these certain capital gaps or these particular sectors. And uh, li limited partner capital that has a complex uh, um, a set of priorities around not just returns on capital, but also quality of education and outcome are actually quite scarce, right? And Omidyar Network is, is, is very interesting because they have one limited partner that, that has this complex uh, set of needs. And so I was wondering if you could kind of enlighten everybody and talk about the role of limited partners and, and how there's a challenge in educating limited partners. Thank you, Michael. And Charles, you're building a fund for yeah, this no, sector. No, perhaps you can enlighten us, as Michael said. I think, I mean, the point is, is it's very valid in the sense of trying to find the right sources to support this. And this capital gap is, is very evident and, and we ourselves are in the process of trying to put together a fund which will focus on just that gap because of this, the shortage. In the process of trying to raise the, the, that capital, then it goes to exactly the point. We can't go to the typical sources of capital because they, one, don't like the risk profile. There's no evidential support of other funds like this that have made sufficient financial returns. The length of time is difficult and the priorities. So all of those are challenges. So so where are we getting responses? Interestingly, it's one from larger strategic players, so bigger organizations who are corporates who have a much longer term strategic view and prepared to put capital into a fund which are not bound by the usual strictures. And the other group tends to be uh, kind of family offices which have a personal interest through their own wealth creation about being involved in longer term projects. But that creates a much smaller universe, which is ultimately your point, which goes to the fact that why there is a shortage of capital in, in this space. Ultimately, where does this go? The, the real answer is we have to be successful at making these projects work and make these investments. Because if we get it right, we will create the sense that this is a good place to invest. And if there are success stories, that breeds success in itself by bringing further capital. So, you know, what I ask is, is let us all success. be incredibly successful. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Vinet? There isn't uh, um, sufficient supply. I mean, we, we, we are in many ways in um, um, a very fortunate position to be able to, uh, to do what we do. And we you know, try and share everything that we've learned, the good and the, <laughs> and, and the hard lessons. Um, and there are other uh, sort of families uh, who are trying to uh, also get involved, and that's great to see. What's also encouraging is, again, this goes back to the regulatory frameworks. What's encouraging to see is that people are trying to change things. So, uh, again, I'm not a U.S. expert, but I believe just last week the White House signed uh, a change in the ERISA code, which allows pension funds to be able to look at other things. So one of the challenges for the pension funds is they're saying, if we invest in anything which might have a higher risk 
lower return uh, possibility, um, are we in breach of our fiduciary duty? Now, that needs a change in the regulatory framework. And in many uh, countries, to, to Ashwin's point, it's country by country. So the US has just unlocked that. It's going to be curious to see. There's $15 trillion of capital. Not all of it will suddenly flow, flow into this, but hopefully um, some will. It also goes back to, the, to again, the, the enlightened role of the state. So if you look at the Israeli venture capital sector, it's a phenomenal sector. You go back to the 70s, it didn't exist. So what, or not in the same scale, what did the Israeli government do? They said, we will help seed, match, subordinate our money for the first wave of Israeli venture capital funds. You have to bring other people's money in. We'll stay behind. We'll be subordinated. We may even cap our returns. After that first cohort, they never needed to do that again. Interesting, very interesting. So we have someone, and then to you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm been to do, the special envoy of the African Union. Um, the, one of the questions I have in this concern, uh, what the um, gentleman from uh, Kenya, um, listening to the South African example, and it goes the question also to all of you, in terms of South South cooperation. South Africa have shown this model of funding um, the EDU loan, and uh, Kenya um, is appealing um, to you, all of you, but um, in particular, I think South Africa, how that model can be shared to other countries in Africa or others? Are you planning um, um, to invest as well in other countries? That so is a specific um, in terms of scaling what's happening in South Africa to other places. Thank you. We definitely do have ambitions of going into the rest of the continent because of two reasons. Because we believe uh, there's huge opportunities in the continent as a whole. But over and above that, I believe as South Africans, we owe it to the continent because we are free today because of what the international world has done, but also what the continent has actually done for us. We've started a, a, with a, a, a small fund of 50 million rents to, to go into Zimbabwe, but what, has, what that has created is an exciting opportunity whereby not only are we funding students that are studying in Zimbabwe, but also those that are Zimbabweans that are studying in South Africa because they can come and study in, Zimb in, in South Africa and the people can actually pay, uh, pay from there. We have started exploring also opportunities and partnerships uh, in Kenya. Uh, um, the, the model in Kenya becomes challenging for people that um, want a return because in Kenya you have a fixed rate in terms of what you can pay back. So that is another area that we are looking at to say, because government actually prescribes what interest rate you can charge if, if it's in the education space, right or wrong, but it therefore means that you need to have investors that have the appetite for low returns over a long period of time, which becomes very difficult when it's actually venture cap capital that you are looking at. Well, we are also looking at a whole range of other countries, including Nigeria and, and Zimbabwe, because we think the program that we have is a workable program, but we need more solutions over and above what it is that we do, because it's just not enough for us to be able to scale up, which is an issue that was discussed earlier on. Thank you, Dutsi. Yes, you want to make a comment? Sorry. Yeah, one yes. point to, to that for... For Kenya, uh, if anyone is looking to set up a student lending program anywhere in the world, the first people you should contact is the IFC, uh, because that is one of their big <laughs> thrusts in terms of what they're trying to do in education. In fact, the report that we wrote uh, where we highlighted about 80 models uh, on student lending, those that have been successful and many uh, that have not been, um, was actually something we did with the IFC because they're so committed to driving enrollments in higher education in emerging markets through student lending programs. Thank you. Hello, I'm Liviu from Romania, and I'm um, looking at uh, the panel there, and I say exploring innovative financial model in education. What I heard, it's about how to finance uh, students to follow their courses, which is okay, how to, how to finance institution to offer education, which is also okay. But I didn't heard, and uh, maybe this is innovative, how to finance teacher to deliver education, because in these days, uh, they can do it. They can do blog for mathematics, blog for, ph blog for physics, but, uh, but there are no uh, financial models in order to keep them doing this job in, uh, in the social media, online, 
and paying back through, I don't know, through clicks or through publicity or their, their way in these days in doing this. So maybe a financial model for teachers will help uh, to increase the uh, number of quality teachers and to put the visibility on them. And maybe in, uh, through this way we can deliver education better. We actually have uh, started a pilot whereby you, you partner with a university that can actually teach the teachers. So, because that, that's the challenge. Sometimes you find that teachers don't even know how to switch on a computer. But over and above that, it's teaching teachers how to teach maths using computers. And what, we've, uh, uh, what we are currently uh, finding is that there's grant funding that is available, but I think it's an opportunity to also look at when you finance the teachers and make sure that you can get the payback, that it is an area that we can look at. We've started having engagements with one of the, of, of the, the MECs for education who says, I need teachers in maths, in technology, and in, in science. So can we make sure that we fund that area and that area only so that I can make sure that I can be a pilot so that we can upscale it for the country as a whole. So your point is a very good point and it's a valid point, but I think, again, the issue of scaling up becomes a challenge. But we need to pilot somewhere, start it somewhere, see how the model works because then the VCs will then be interested once we know that the, the, the model works. Any comment? Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's, there's actually very uh, interesting things happening in South Korea. So, uh, I mean, some of this is, as, as, as Tutsi was saying, there's like pilots and, and they're in parts of India as well. People have said, if we incentivize teachers that if your kids get better grades, we'll, you'll get more. I mean, you know, and then you have other uh, uh, people get concerned of, will teachers just teach to the test? You know, that's, but in South Korea, where after school is vibrant, uh, there was actually recently the number two tuition company in South Korea tried to poach the best teacher tutor of the number one tuition company with a national ad in the paper saying, come join us, we'll pay you $10 million. And the guy said, no, I'm quite happy where I am. So, I mean, this goes to, it's, there, there is demand for knowledge, right? And, and it's not just between, you know, 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. whenever the school starts and 3 p.m. whenever the school finishes. It's 24 hours. You just have to find if you can unlock ways so that people who want to supply that and people who want to want to demand that can connect, then you can have some very interesting things happen. Thank you. Charles, you have a comment for that? Yeah, there was just one other example. I think that, if I remember rightly, the business called My Lesson Plan in the US um, where effectively teachers can s effectively sell kind of lesson plans and other resources to other teachers in the, in the network. And that has grown into quite a big business. Um, and so what it shows is that there are networks that can join up the kind of teaching community and so that they can access and get benefit from some of the work they've done within the kind of larger teaching environment. And there's, a, there's a, another business uh, which is called Test Connect, which has a network of about three to four million teachers around the world where they share resources in amongst themselves to help kind of in terms of delivery into, into the classroom. Thank you. We have a few more minutes and I want want to focus the last minute in the bottom of the pyramid, no? It looks like a lot of this capital and a lot of these cases, many of the ones you, yeah, you reported, are more into the emerging middle class, no? They have more technology, they have some more income to demand more education. What's happening at the bottom of the pyramid, where technology is probably less, where the income is, is of course, uh, less as well? Do you, do you see, Ashwin, to start with you, any case you, 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 you check uh, James, Coursera, but they're not going, uh, perhaps, bridge. C can you tell us, or share some cases where they are having impact there? Yeah, I think for the, profit cases? The, the best example is bridge, um, and it's, it's highlighted as a case study, but they, there they are really delivering much better quality education than the public system would. Um, at How a, do you know that? At a, well, you can just see from when you go and tour the schools and you see the uh, systems they've got in place to keep on continuously assessing the, the children, so to ensure that there's continuous assessment to make sure that they're grasping some of the basic concepts around maths and English and science. It's, it's something you can see. And they've invested a lot in the, the technology and the curriculum development uh, and the teacher training. So um, it, it ensures that the teachers who aren't very well trained can deliver the, the, the education. 
So I think bridge is a good example of that. But you're right. It, it's the bottom of the pyramid uh, is few and far between. I think Vinit will know more about that. But then again, there are in emerging models like Codus Trust, which is much more of a vocational model based on a technology platform uh, that seeks to do it. Yes, there are some of these online um, uh, platforms, but, but they haven't, again, reached scale. And they're much smaller than they actually are in terms of revenue. Do they have technology? When it's, it's, or do they have access to internet or infrastructure to you know even in a market like online. Bangladesh you can that you can get access and you know you you ha and and many times it takes a different form from from a PC because mobile connectivity is much better in some of these markets so again going back to bridge how do they ensure that they get paid they use mpay they use the uh, mobile uh, uh, payments channel uh, which which is actually really innovative we haven't seen it in many parts of the world yeah. thank you Vinet You're, are you investing in any specific cases and the one that you can share? Yes, I mean, we, we, we're obviously an, an investor, a very early investor in Bridge, and we are invested in uh, um, some ed tech companies. We're also looking at some other sort of school operators. I think to, to your question on, on, you know, if you're talking about the, the bottom quintile, it's, it's a purchasing power problem. I mean, the, the reality is the purchasing power of households that are unfortunate enough to be in that position is very, very limited. Um, so... What that leads to is a couple of ways. So w one approach is where uh, a lot of businesses are saying, can we start to develop mixed models where we can try and have uh, you know, uh, um, emerging middle or upper middle customers take the revenues from that and cross subsidize. Um, that's great. If you s aggregate that up to the system level, it's probably not a workable solution just because the numbers, uh, you know, there are far more uh, people who are too poor to be able to say you can just sim do a simple cross subsidization. You could argue that's what government tax is meant to be doing, right? Which leads to the second uh, 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 part that for the bottom uh, quintile, it's who is making that purchase decision. Because cash flows are being set aside for uh, the education. Now, right now, those cash flows are being spent by people who are not the families themselves. Um, and so you have to then start to work within that. Is it possible to um, deliver transformational quality to people at the very bottom? Absolutely. People are people. They are, they, I mean, we, we see, I mean, there's an after school organization we uh, support. It happens to be a nonprofit just because the revenue model isn't there yet. But um, they take township kids in, 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 in South Africa who come in with 22, 23% entry uh, sort of scores failing. Within two years, six distinctions uh, and accepted to the University of Cape Town. Within two years, all right? And this is grade 10, so people who say, oh, it's easy to teach younger kids. This is secondary school kids living in very, very challenging areas. It is possible. It's the, how you pay for it is the key issue. Very interesting. Tutsi, your experience in South Africa? I think the issue of triple partnerships is something that we we have s s sadly moved away from because what does it mean triple partnership? It, it's more making sure that there's partnerships between government, the private sector, and the NGO sector for us to be able, particularly, to deliver for the for 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 the lower end of the market because you, we, we can't continue to make them even more poorer by not ensuring that uh, uh, those issues are addressed. But again, if government is not keen to engage the private sector, it becomes a bit difficult for you to reach out because, as you say, it, it, you, you need to make sure that it's, 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 over time it's profitable. But if you're doing it alone as a private sector, it becomes a bit of... And I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but the one other area that we've looked at, yes, we don't have scale, but a small organization as we are, we also look at other innovative programs whereby we can energize our individual employees to actually fund individual students because that is our way of also giving back because we need to teach also our employees that it is their responsibility to give back to the communities that we serve. We also provide a, a, a bursary for a student so that we can make sure that that student, when they complete, they can ensure that they pass it forward. It's not in scale, but it's... And, and I think sometimes we always look at, at millions because even if you touch one soul, that soul is going to make a difference. And we need to make sure that as individuals, particularly those of us that have more than the others, that we also give back as a collective or as individuals so that we can make a difference.
Thank you. Any final comment, Charles? I think the, the only thing I would add to that is, and it picks up on a point you made, Ashwin, about mobile. And I think, you know, particularly for emerging markets and that, that bottom quintile, then, you know, what's interesting is that it's ultimately it's linking into the kind of purchasing capability is how do we have a cost-efficient way of distributing to that environment? And mobile, to my view, is the only way that that's really going to work because that's widely distributed. It can be done at a low marginal cost and we can really get to those communities. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, Ashwin, Vinet, Tutsit, and thank you all of you guys for being here. And this is it. Have a good lunch.